I'm joined today by Tiller Russell, the uh, writer and director of Silk Road, which is available now on demand. Um, how are you doing today, Tiller? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for, for having me on the show. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you. I, I really enjoyed Silk Road. Um, and it was you adapted it from a Rolling Stone article by David Kushner, in which an ambitious 20-something libertarian uh, starts a, uh, a multi-million dollar dark web store uh, in which you can buy anything from hardcore drugs to, by the end of it, you know, weapons. Um, I vaguely remember reading the piece when it came out, but I don't it's, it's a little bit hazy. I don't remember the, the DEA agent connection, the one that brought him down. I wonder, uh, can you tell me how you discovered this story and talk a bit about the road to adapting it for the screen? Um, absolutely. I first um, became fascinated with the story the day after Ross Ulbricht was arrested in San Francisco in the sci-fi section of the Glen Park Library. Uh, <laughs> I was off shooting a, uh, shooting a crime documentary at the time, and I, um, I vividly remember opening the paper and reading the story. And there was just kind of initial cursory reporting about it, where it was dark web marketplace and Dread Pirate Roberts and sort of initial mentions of Bitcoin before any of this was in the zeitgeist in a significant way. But I remember vividly um, having sort of a strong emotional reaction thinking, man, there's a story there. There's a movie there. It may be a doc. It may be a feature film. I don't know what, but I'm fascinated to learn more. And so as somebody who spends a lot of time um, combing through crime stories uh, to adapt either as you know documentaries like The Night Stalker or a feature film like Silk Road, um, it was a story that I had been clocking and tracking pretty closely. And eventually David Kushner, this, this brilliant um, you know, writer and reporter had published, um, published an article in Rolling Stone that was this very um, humanist uh, portrait of Ross Ulbricht. And, and kind of um, that became the launch pad for, for uh, the adaptation and for turning it into a screenplay and subsequently a movie. And so, um, that piece of this, that piece of the story, you know, there was brilliant reporting on on sort of Ross, his family, and um, his ex girlfriend Julia V, who was one of the primary sources for David Kushner at the time, actually came on board to be a consultant for the film. You know, in oh. the writing of it and in and, and shooting the film, because I wanted to. Um, hopefully get as close as possible to, to Ross in a fundamental way. Um, and, 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 and having somebody who knew him intimately, who loved him, who had a very close perspective on him was, was a valuable way in. And then there was of course, you know, all of the materials that, that the archival sort of materials that, that Ross had left in his wake. You know, it was the public postings as Dread Pirate Roberts on the website. It was the, the journals that were on his laptop, which was kind of confiscated after his arrest. There were the chat logs, which were entered into the evidentiary record during trial. Um, and, and then, but in a way, it, to me, it was only at that point half a story or half a movie. And, and so eventually the other half of the story began to come to light, which was that there were um, several crooked law enforcement officers who were you know, initially trying to bring Ross down and then at a certain point flipped over and were trying to, you know, to fleece him, to rob him. And so, and, and so that half of the movie, you know, it portrayed by Jason Clark and the character Rick Bowden, which is you know, a composite character, um, suddenly, um, um, that when I had the two sides of the story, what felt like the two halves, two, two sides of the same coin in some fundamental way, um, very, you know, diff, sort of divided by, you know, age and generation and perhaps political philosophy. And, you know, one's this young millennial upstart kind of disruptor. The other is this, you know, analog knock around old school, they call them Jurassic narcs. So yeah. suddenly when, um, it was sort of conceived as this two-hander of these two guys on these, um, you know, colliding arcs. Suddenly, it felt like, okay, that's a movie to me. Well, the in adapting it, the the feeling I got away uh, took away from the film is it's like a leaner and more humanized, less flashy version of Heat, where you do have these two parallel stories going on that that eventually um, collide. So, how much of that was? creative license on your part versus did you get any access to the real Ross Ulbricht or were you able to find out who any of these agents were that were the composite of the Jason Clark character or were you just kind of left on your own to think I've got these sort of elements but how do I make this into a real 
drama. Uh, I'll say that a couple of the the nice visual flares that you've got there, uh, both involving uh, vomit, which I won't spoil, <laughs> but the way that you play them, uh, it's it's a very clear uh, parallel. I just wonder, is that like tidbits that you picked up from the research or when you're writing, you're like, oh, this would be a kind of a cool thing to, to drop in to really tie these together for the audience? Well, I would say it's a, it's an excellent question, and I would say that there's you know there's a combination of it. Where as a as a as a documentary filmmaker, you know, I brought a lot of those methodologies to bear on this particular project. Where you're you know you're combing through the record, every report that's ever been you know written, every article that's ever come out, every book, you know, everything that's in you know that was entered into evidence during trial provided a very strong um, launch pad for the launching pad for the movie. And for example, by way of example, I'll just say. You know, all of the voiceover that's in the movies that's spoken by Nick Robinson, all of that is taken directly from the historical record, right? That's taken from the from the diaries or from, um, you know, the, 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 the posts as Dread Pirate Roberts, so that the goal is hopefully to get as close in some sort of spiritual sense to Ross as, as a person. And then, you know, again, having his ex-girlfriend as, as a sort Sort of window and lens into it, um, and then you know some of the the sort of more uh, you know ludicrous, seemingly ludicrous plot points. You know the you know the the, uh, the the fake murder of Curtis Clark Green, and you know as you alluded to, you know played by Paul Walker Hauser, who I think is just such a such a brilliant, terrific actor and everything he ever shows up in. Um, all of that stuff, is, you know, is drawn very closely from from the historical record and actually down to literally matching kind of. In individual photographs so that there were strong kind of visual guideposts and, and signs to follow. And, and similarly with the evolution of the Silk Road website, you know, that was kind of carefully mapped as it evolves, you know, in its earliest iteration from underground brokers to different versions of the interface. Um, and yet on the uh, sort of on the crooked cop side of things, there was a finite amount of information which was available and in, in the public record. Um, and um, the so from that material you I was able to extrapolate and sort of excavate the bones of the story and the bones of characters and then to that you know as somebody that has spent a lot of time covering um, you know crime stories and spent time with narcs and cops you know good cops and bad cops and and and, and informants and sort of knows that world um, fairly intimately uh, I was drawing from people that I know and sort of psychologies that I know and dynamics that I know and and, um, you know, specific people, you know, inspired it. And then they become kind of grafted on to, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of journalistic record that exists with regards to Silk Road. So it's a blend. And I felt like it was important to, you know, acknowledge that from the very outset, as you see in those opening title cards, <laughs> um, you know, it, you know, and so, so, so that was, that was the, that was the workflow. Well, you know, the I don't know much about these these crooked cops that were involved in the story, but I will say that um, Rick, the Jason Clark character, is a type of so-called crooked cop that we don't really see a lot of because, you know, as a viewer, I found it hard to pin him down as being a, a bad guy. He does commit a crime in this, you know, in sort of in service of his job, but not really. But it's a really great moral dilemma it's not he's not harvey Keitel and bad lieutenant you know right. um so yeah can congrats on that aspect um you do seem to have a, a real passion for for true crime in terms of you know tv series documentaries that you've done in addition to silk road coming out last week you had a richard ramirez docuseries on netflix last month so what's the what's the fascination what's the obsession well, I think that there is there is inherently great drama in crime stories. You know, anybody that walks out the door and you know is carrying a gun for the job, whether you're a gangster or whether you're a cop, literally every time you walk out the the, the door to go to work, and for the crooks, it is going to work. It, you know, that's a job too, and so. When, when that is the case, there are a level of stakes sort of beyond which we all live, you know, in a civilian society. These guys, uh, you know, and women um, are in um, a level of drama and tension and stakes which we as civilians rarely participate in. And so, um, and I think also because of the extreme nature of those stories, 
you have people that are internally very conflicted and you have people for whom the forces of light are warring with the forces of darkness. And to me, it's always character above all else that captivates me as a storyteller. Um, you know, plot is fascinating, whether you're hunting down a serial killer, you know, in the streets of Los Angeles in the 80s, or whether you're a, you know, um, you know crooked DEA agent trying to bust a, you know, a, a sort of millennial kingpin, like all of that is, there are um, complexities of morality and of the kind of character uh, logical choices, I guess, that they're having to make in those extreme circumstances. And to me, that's where the richness and the fascination comes in. Well, as far as the um, the, the protagonist, or at least the, the main characters of this movie, um, you know, Silk Road one of the criticisms I've read of the film, and it's not one that I share, but it's very interesting, is that you're essentially platforming a libertarian. And that is a breed of political creature who, along with conservatives, is pretty much not the type of anti-hero that pop culture wants to see right now. Um, was there any concern on your part or on the part of Nick Robinson, who plays Ross Albrecht, uh, of you know making an outspoken anti-government uh, activists, the center of your film, even if the, the underlying story of the film doesn't necessarily agree with those politics? Well, I, I mean, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, as artists and storytellers, we have to trust our instincts. And, um, you know, half the people are going to like something and half the people are going to dislike something. And, you know, I can't, con I can't control that. A at the end of the day, um, I feel like my job is to tell a um, comp compelling, hopefully, and nuanced version of, of these stories. And this is, as far as I understand it, the truth of who Ross is as a human being. And that may be against the grain of the culture. It may be politically offensive to some. Um, to me, it's actually fascinating, the fact that it is against the grain of the culture and that it is kind of complex and unexpected. And the controversial nature of it is actually what fascinates me. And so, you know, well, you, you make a movie, you want everybody to like it. At the end of the day, um, I have to, you know, fly by such lights as are given me and, um, and, and do the, the version of it that seems the most compelling and the most accurate uh, to me. And, and, and so, so that's what I've done. Here's a bit of an odd question. Uh, it's one I couldn't help wonder watching the film. Did you have any issues with rights clearances for UPS, FedEx, and DHL, essentially reminding people or perhaps exposing audiences for the first time to the fact that they were the unwitting couriers in a global <laughs> criminal enterprise? Well, you know, that's that's one of the fascinating aspects to the story is, and I think that's one of the, um, you know, um, reasons why this story was so kind of explosive is that suddenly the drug war, you know, the drug game as it had existed and consequently the drug war as it was being fought was kind of existentially under siege when suddenly the mailman is your dope dealer and he has absolutely no idea that that's the case. Um, and so, um, uh, of course, there were legal complexities, you know, all across the board with it because it is a true story and there are, you know, these different, um, you know, um, people, entities, corporations, um, you know, that's always is a, a very complicated um, nature of it at the same uh, of telling a story like this at the same time it is what happened and um, and so I think when you are um, trying to stay as close to um, the facts you know in a fundamental sense as possible the ar the armies of lawyers and everything you know vet them along the way and you make adjustments but um, I feel like it is a um, largely accurate sort of uh, rendition of, of the phenomenon, the way the Silk Road worked and the players that were involved in it. Cool. Um, finally, the recent stock market upset involving GameStop and Wall Street bets doesn't amount to a cons criminal conspiracy as far as we know, but there is a similar anti-authoritarianism populist streak to the one that you talk about in Silk Road with that story. Do you see parallels there? And you know, what do you make of these sort of resurgent themes of underground uprisings in the recent years? It's, it, it's, a, it's a very astute um, comment and analysis. I think, you know, 
populist revolt is something that has long existed in America from the time of William Jennings Bryan forward until now through the GameStop controversies. And um, there is also, it's kind of a cornerstone of the American way in some way, the, the kind of defiant um, independence, freedom, individualism, and the ability to, to kind of fight the system, fight the man. And you know, the political pendulum swings one way or another, and sometimes the prevailing winds, you know, are very much against that. Sometimes the prevailing winds are for it. And it, you know, it, these are, there's no simple answers to these, to these stories, but I think there is a cyclical nature to them. And so I think there is a continuum between GameStop, Silk Road, like I said, all the way back to William Jennings Bryan, some of which is baked into the American experience. Definitely. Well, uh, thank you for, for taking the time again to, to talk with me. Um, I really enjoyed the movie. I think everyone should check it out. Um, it's got some really great challenging uh, ideas and some unexpected emotional impacts uh, for a story like this. So uh, thank you very much. Good luck in the future. And it's been a real pleasure. Really grateful for your time. Thank you for taking the time and interest and, and you stay safe and be good. All right. You too, man. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.